Message 809, how to develop free energy in various ways. Or more specifically in this video, we're going to ask the question, why does Don Smith's system result in CPS squared? How many of you won't understand or appreciate that, but for those of you who do, you can ponder that question as we go through uh, many things today. So we're going to look at an example of a collection system that collects free energy. And yes, what I mean by that is non-conventional energy collection in which is normally not considered or discarded, where we can collect more energy from the environment without producing more uh, work to do it. In other words, we get more work done for less work entered into the system. So how are we going to do that? Now I'm going to cover some basics and get into things in detail and go through the whole system. So we might be here all night. <laughs> and if you know me, I can talk. So. We're going to go over, this is looking at a dipole system of energy. And, but before we get into that, we're going to talk about free energy itself. So when you think of, and we talked about these things before in previous videos, but I'm going to be getting specifically into other things tonight. So we're going to look at the idea of collecting energy from the environment. Now, most people or people who have gone up to a, like a college level of education in physics don't believe that you can have a free lunch. Although they do believe that with solar panels they can collect energy from the sun or with wind generation they can collect it from the wind in which they don't have to work for that. So we're going to talk about another type of system that does the same sort of thing but produces a lot more gain than those produce. So what happens with a wind generator? So what happens with a wind generator is you put like a sailboat, you put a sail up in the air, right? And the wind pushes against it. And of course with the boat, it moves it along. And all you have to do is raise it and it's there for your taking. With the solar panel, you put the solar panel out and it collects rays from the sun in which can be, with the right collector, collect energy and then you have to transform it to use it. So we're going to look at the different processes or um, stages of free energy collection. So you have to have a source. You have to have something that, well there's a difference between the source of energy and the first stage which is um, a trigger or a something that produces the initial um, action that you're going to benefit from. I'm trying to make it really simple here. So you have to look at these collection systems, these energy per generation systems, as not one process. There's several stages that you're going to go through to get your desired result. For example, even with you collecting energy from the power company, if you believe that's what really is happening, you, you have a generation system in which produces alternating current. Now this comes down the wire and that's another stage, the transmission of this to you. So the generation of it, the creation the form of it, and then going down the line 
transmitting it, trans yeah, so you're transforming it along the way, higher voltage, lower voltages, and then it comes into your house. It gets metered, another stage. And then it gets distributed as either 210 or 110 or 210. AC. Then it goes into, for example, your printer. I have over here a printer. And that printer doesn't run off of AC, so there's a transformer. We're going to look at some transformers. And then it transforms the energy to a lower voltage. And then it rectifies it, changes it to DC. Direct current, right? Not alternating. And a lot of your appliances are going to be running off of DC. So there's a lot of things that, a lot of processes that take place. It's not just all one process. So you got to break it down. So a lot of people know how to do many of these processes, but don't understand all of them or how they all work together. So in this particular case, we're going to look at this kind of as a trigger that's going to trigger an avalanche. So when you think about an avalanche, so think about this. When I snap my fingers, say I'm at the top of a mountain, it's covered in snow. Now I didn't put that snow there, and um, nor do I think that the energy I per I um, use to snap my fingers is equal to the amount of energy resulting in the avalanche. I, I listened to something the other day, it was 250 miles an hour or something. These avalanches go down the mountain, creating a lot of force and destruction. Nevertheless, there's a lot of activity. And all it took was me to snap my fingers, or maybe cough or whatever. Very little energy, and that's the trigger energy. So we're going to look at that in comparison to this plasma column here. We're going to turn that on and it's going to be um, doing its thing. Very little energy. So think about it in that way. Right? All I got to do is snap my fingers and I've created a massive energy um, manifestation. So in this case, I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to produce another effect around this dipole, this plasma tube. And I can either not collect it or I can collect it. Just like the sun is shining, I can collect that with a solar panel or the wind is blowing and I could power a wind generator windmill or I could have a sailboat move. I know people that have gone across the world in sailboats and through the wind, with the wind. It's amazing. It's freely there. I don't think anybody disputes that. <laughs> so are there other forms of energy like that that can be collected? Of course there's other conventional systems, we don't need to get into them, where you can collect energy. Differentials between hot and cold and so forth. Where you're receiving something that you didn't have to work for. So weather related, all agreeable. So what if there is electrical phenomena beyond the solar that you can also collect? And, you know, many people don't believe. As long as their teachers didn't tell them about it, they don't believe it's possible. Right? Oh, that's all hokey pokey stuff. Well, most of you are 
not believing that anyway, so I don't need to try and get into that argumentation. So what we have here, what I want to get into now is going through the different stages of collecting energy. I'm trying to do this video as well for audio purposes as well. So I'm going to be trying to describe things in word and not be so dependent upon the camera here. So there are several stages. You can break it down, and I've said this before, into the three basic stages of a free energy system. You have a trigger. So you've created, for example, the snapping of my fingers. The initial movement, which is different than the ambient, right? So we've created a sound, we've created a vibration, a trigger. And that's easy to do. I think everybody can do that, although you can do that wrong in a free energy device where you get it mixed up. Like it's not pure or it's more noise than distinct or whatever. Nevertheless, that's not usually the problem that people have. So you have this event. Now if you snapped your fingers here, there's no avalanche happening. But if I go to the right location where there, um, I can combine it with a secondary process where I influence something, boom, then I can create an avalanche. And of course, well, I had to get there. Well, maybe I can send a drone. <laughs> anyway, so the secondary process now is kind of the... Um, not the application yet. It's a collection phase or stage. So now you're going to collect or create another process that's necessary. Um, and again, these kind of stages can overlap each other. We can make them into five or six stages or, you know, there can be several ways of breaking this down. So in this case, we're going to have a collector in these plates here, All right? They're going to collect energy somehow or another that is not considered to be there. It's not nor like if people knew it was there, they would be doing this <laughs> um, while they're watching their plasma tube. <laughs> and we'll turn it on in a minute. I don't need to turn it on yet because it's shocking. <laughs> anyway, this is going to collect energy and then we have to go from that and we could call the third stage, which is really two stages, the transformation utilization stage. Now if it was going directly to a battery, then you could consider that one stage. Like I'm sending this energy into a battery, which is both transforming the energy to this desirable um, form, and then it's storing the charge as well, which is kind of could be an end result for various, you can go from there and utilization for whatever, but you could call that the utilization phase too or stage, I should say. So you want to look at it three different ways. Divide it in your mind. And it's, it's helpful to do that because if you try and make it all one, you're going to get misunderstanding of what's going on. So what we want to do is go over the Don Smith. Of course, it's in the book, my book, The Don Smith, Magnetic Resonance Energy Crafting systematic index book, which is about two years old now or so, or how, yeah, about two years maybe. Anyway, this book goes over a variety of optional types of systems. So I'm going to go over some today, and this is one of them.
This is a plasma column, or you could say a plasma tube, as opposed to a plasma ball, which I have over here. I'm not going to show that. So what we have here is the essential idea is um, well, first of all, you have a little driver circuit at the base. I can show this later on. I'll take it apart and show afterwards. You have a little driver system and it's a high voltage um, and a higher frequency. So that means we're going to go up to about 2400 volts here and their impulses. And they're impulsing at, I think it's around 20, this one's about 26,000 times a second. So that's your frequency. Cycles per second. And you can call it hertz as well. So that means 28,000 times, or 20, in this case 26, the plasma ball is 28,000. So this is making activity that many times a second. It's too fast to visualize, but we can see it on this little scope in a minute. So now what's going to happen is the movement is going up and down. Well, it's kind of going out or however you want to describe it. But the activity that I'm after is a movement from from the bottom to the top. I don't want side to side. Some of you have tried to do this and this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this video so I don't have to spend the time talking to people on the phone about it. I want to go over the details. So this is kind of like a phone call that I would have had with somebody except there's no back and forth. I just had one of these conversations last night so I thought hey it's fresh in my mind I will just kind of go over what the questions were asked. So somebody made a plasma ball and tried to do this but the activity was shorting out and it wasn't doing this up and down fashion. If these plates are in this direction which is horizontal here and I'll describe these plates in a minute, then I need to have the activity going up and down. So the idea is these are, so what I have here are on the top, I should probably have it the other way around. So I have suspended here with a cardboard tube around the plasma tube just to hold it up and isolate it from the glass. So what I have here is a copper plate with a hole cut out and I'm about an inch away from the plasma tube. That's very important. And if I had a plasma ball I'll have to explain that in a minute where you position that. But you want to be at least or a good three quarters to an, an inch away from the glass because if you're any close if if you're closer you're going to have you're going to affect the operation of the plasma tube or the ball and then you're going to have it going in the same direction as the plates the activity and you don't want that you want it to be independent making Making, we're going to make some wind here. We're going to call it heavy side wind. So this is kind of a, a electrical wind, which you can't really notice. Maybe if you have some sensitivity, you can feel it. Anyway, what's going to happen is we want it. So we don't want to load down the trigger. We don't want to load down our fingers to create the avalanche. If I if I put a strain on my fingers, I won't be able to make any sound. It'll be too weighed down. We want it to freely operate. Boom. 
takes a little bit of energy. We don't need to try and tap that, right? All we want is an influence. We don't want current transfer. We don't want to transfer like they do in conventional systems where you have to pay for it. We want just a little bit of tiny bit of energy that runs freely and we can, you know, replenish that. I'll show you how in a minute. If we try and make a direct connection, then you're always going to get lot with your losses. You're going to never going to get a gain. And that's why people don't believe this is possible. And so I had some guy come to my meeting last meeting and say it doesn't work <laughs> and they brought it out and showed and he had made these holes too small so that they were literally arcing over to the plates and that's not how to do this it's fundamentally misunderstanding how this works and according to Don Smith's diagrams which I have here and again I'm not going to be getting into all the pictures and all that it's all in the book and you can see those things all you know most of you already know that or have the book already but I want to go over the things that you might be missing <laughs> the little details that should be obvious but people miss them so you can you got to cut out the holes big enough and then you've got to then I'm not even doing this right here you've got to between so you've got one sheet aluminum, one sheet um, copper, two dissimilar metals. And those work great because they conduct. So what happens is you have to create an insulator, a dielectric, between those two plates. So you want to make it bigger all around so you want to make it you know maybe a half inch bigger sticking out from those two plates all the way around and on the inside you also want maybe at least a quarter inch the reason for that is it can arc over between um, in this case I've got a pretty thick piece of um, plastic here and the voltage at 2400 volts isn't big enough to jump over but anyway I'm not even doing this right here because on one side it's pretty much on the edge but at least on the inside I want to do that for sure so so that without doing that right then you're not going to get results which is what somebody had now if you're going to do a plasma ball you wouldn't want to put this on the equator of the ball like on the center because in that case the very center of the ball has another ball inside of it where this is coming where the arcing sparking is coming out of the plasma generation and well you could say it's coming from the gas and you could look at it one way or the other that's not my point in this video to get into that but in this case it would be going horizontally and it would be arcing out so you're not going to get the activity that you're after if you put that plasma ball if you put the holes for the plasma ball right there you want it to be like on towards the top like about three quarters high that way you're going to get some activity going up and down that's what you're after with this type of thing now just so that you know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here but there's a chance that I will forget to mention this so when I cut out those four pieces I only have one of the pieces here shown because I have to find where the other ones are what I I had a whole bunch of these plates cut out and so the pieces that I I already had a hole in it and so I made my little sandwiches here so copper 
plastic and aluminum and then so I made a little capacitor so this is a capacitor these are the two plates of a capacitor and, um, and that's my dielectric the plastic in between so this is a, say a high voltage high frequency wire so if I send and this is insulated to 40,000 volts DC so you think that's pretty well insulated if I say did 10,000 volts and I did whatever frequency there's no way that's going to be leaking or anything right you're not worried about it so it's not influencing anything right wrong so I can collect in the same way I was showing it horizontally but let's put it vertically So in the same way as that plasma column, we're going to just, we can just use a one wire. Or you can look at two coils in the same way. In this case, the red coil here is the primary. So in the same way, the plasma column is a primary. Or if we want to do, again, another Don Smith system, we can have the magnets inside the tube be the kind of primary sort of <laughs> there is the um, yeah they're kind of like a primary yeah it's like a primary so anyway when we have movement in supposedly inside the wire but really it's around the wire at a high frequency like radio frequency like 20 kilohertz 20,000 times per second then the energy flows around the wire and you can put a sail there and collect it and again all of you are saying well Rick I've done that and I'm not very getting very much and well that's what this video is about so hang in there we're gonna get to that what you're doing wrong or what you don't understand okay so let's go through it so in this case we're going to look at we're going to turn on the oscilloscope and we're going to measure and we're going to see there's about 2400 volts and th this is moving in this direction up and down or just up if you will or it's in this case well it's kind of going all around as you'll see it's just kind of more random and then what I'm doing is I'm collecting the energy flow that is moving in this direction and this is not ideal this play is too thick it's probably it's like once maybe it's like 1 16th of an inch it should be smaller and I should make it really no air gaps and so forth whatever it's not the point anyway I can collect this and the first point that I want to share is whatever energy I can get from this plate I can add another plate which is what I usually do at my meetings which probably there's no more meetings ever again thanks to the good old fake V <laughs> let's just call it the fake V for those of you who know what I'm talking about so I put this spacer in here just kind of an extension of the cardboard and then put another plate now I could put them directly on top of each other if I put another plastic insulator between them and just make a battery of sorts of collectors so I could put about 60 or so like if I use uh, captain like real thin Kapton material which is good for capacitance or dielectric then that will work great so I could put many many layers if I get some nice thin material here and this is what Don did in his, as you can see in the book so each one of these is a collector and they don't influence each other 
the flow. I mean, they could if you do certain things, but we're not going to get into that. In my case, I'm just going to show them separated. Well, I show them when I normally run this. Separated by about a half an inch or so. And then go up. And so if I can collect so much energy from this plate and add another one and collect it more, it's just additive. And yet, we will see that it doesn't disrupt the primary purpose of the plasma tube. It's not doing anything. Plasma tube doesn't even know that these plates are there or they're collecting any energy. So that should be fascinating so far. Because you never would have thought that would be the case, right? And we're not talking about this thing doing like, you know, like this being like, you know, 1800 watts a heater or something where you can feel the heat. And you know, oh, obviously if there's heat there, then I can do something with that heat. This is about eight watts this runs off of. A little wall wart, which I'll show, well, it's over there, I'll show you it. And it takes eight watts to run the circuit. And it, you know, it's lighting up, it's a toy it's hard to find in the States, but if you're in Europe, you can get it from Conrad. They don't ship them from over there to the United States or Canada because of liability. <laughs> anyway, you can get these from Conrad in Germany because I um, was there and they had them on their website. To get one of these on eBay, it's kind of hard to find. You have to go through thousands of plasma balls before you find the plasma column. Anyway, the point that I want to make is I can load down or I can collect energy here. We'll get to the loading in a minute. But I can do multiple layers. So this is the concept that I've talked about with my coils my resonance kit. So I'm showing here the typical primary coil here that we run with a frequency generator and we put 1,250,000 pulses per second and we make this a transmitter. Now we can also make this coil an, an AM radio with a crystal radio. Same coil. And this was what Don said to start with these coils and the basic setup. So now I can do the same thing. I can so typically run this at one watt and I can make a hundred watts of output with this coil. Now I make a bigger coil with a higher Q for those of you who know what that means, the quality factor and a high quality capacitor. In this case we have these little blue capacitors here which are 100 picofarads. And I can have a thousand times output which I've done and I've demonstrated that. So <laughs> it may appear small and if you want one watt input what's what are you going to do practically with one watt, right? Well, what if I have a hundred times output? <laughs> so what I've shown in my videos is that the whole area around this transmitter coil is uh, being influenced. Whatever you want to call it. I don't care about words. I don't care about arguing about words. So I'm influencing the environment, the local environment around just like this plasma column, just like all these other devices that I have, and what's in Don Smith's book. So now, what's happening is I can put other collectors, in this case it's a coil, in that case it's a capacitor plate, right? So now I'm collecting different ways, I'm collecting 
different things that are going on here in the environment. So I'm creating different types of wind, if you will. And so now, like I've shown in previous videos, if you go back, you cannot prove over unity over the internet, um, which is interesting because it's really relevant to the deep faking that's going to be a big part of the future, deep faking videos and so forth. Anyway, in that video, I showed many coils being influenced by the transmitter. Now again, conventional lack of wisdom tells you that all the energy from this coil is just being spread out and being absorbed by the receiver coils, right? So in other words, if you've got one watt worth of energy in this transmitter, you can only have less than one watt of total collection because you're never going to be able to collect all of it. Right? You're going to have the losses. So everybody who believes that just might as well move on and just have your solar panels and forget it. You know? If you want to, if you want to learn about that deception, just go watch Electro Boom. <laughs> that guy. Oh, I won't get into it on YouTube. Anyway, Rick, you can't get a free lunch. You can only get out what you put in. Well, how is it that I can run for one watt? and have this influenced and produce a given amount of output from that collection. And then I put another one over here and another one over there, another one, and I put 500 of these coils around. I'm not going to say how many I've actually done, but I've shown at least at my meetings and in these videos, at least 75 but it's not just, whenever I've shown them, I've only shown them like this all around on this level. But you can also go up high 360 all the way around this. Spherically all around everywhere. And one isn't diminishing the other. Right now, some of you are saying, well, I do this and I do that and it affects things. Well, I don't know you're, what you're doing exactly, but I know what I've shown and I know what I do. So what happens is I can collect energy. Now I shouldn't brush that off because that is a big point. Uh, it's not really what I want to get into because that's kind of a different subject, but I guess I'll have to address it a little bit here. So if you're too closely coupled, like one of these debunkers that tried to debunk me <laughs> and they put them like right up to each other well that becomes an extension of the transmitter when you're touching them or coming really close they're too closely coupled so now you're really uh, you might be electrically isolated but you're capacitively coupled and you could be capacitively coupled way out here but there is quite a difference when you get out of this what I call the near near field <laughs> whatever you want to call it when you get where you're not directly coupled to the transmitter so in other words the transmitter is still freely running and that's exactly what I was talking about by cutting these holes out in these plates for this plasma column if I make those cuts too small then I'm one with the plasma tube those plates are one with the plasma tube and now you're just kind of shorting out the system. So, but what my point is that I can add multiple coils all around here, each one collecting so much energy and it becomes obvious if you have enough of these coils, even with not doing the stuff that I want to get into in this video, um, how to multiply the energy further than what you're normally used to, um, but we're just We've just shown the basics so far with this kit, and I'll get into more as we go along. 
But even with that, I can have clearly more output than what this was taking to run to produce the snapping of the fingers. So all these coils are like the avalanche effect. And each one is in its own environment with its own set of electrons. And more electrons get drawn into it when it's in resonance. It's kind of the key thing here that's solving the mystery question that I asked at the beginning if you wrote that down. You can always go back and well, probably have it in the title of this message. Uh, like, I'll write it out. Anyway, each coil here is like the snow on the side of the mountain. And this is triggering this coil to respond in its own area. It's not transferring the energy from here to there. It's transferring an influence. And the influence can go and extend beyond this coil to the next one behind it and further and further. Now it is true that that influence spreads out at the square of the distance, but it doesn't dissipate. It doesn't dissipate in the sense that the energy disappears. It actually just spreads out because there's more area as it's going out, it's spreading out. So there's, you have to grasp that at least. I think that's pretty evident, but people don't think that way. So what's happening is I can still collect energy way out here. And um, I mean, there, there's a lot more minor details to get into subtle things that influence each other and all that. That's not my purpose here. My purpose is to make the point that I'm creating an influence like an avalanche effect where I'm not transferring the energy that it from my fingers to produce the great effect of all these coils being powered. They have their own power supply, just like a crystal radio, right? Without the grounding, there's no crystal radio. So it's not the energy coming from the transmitter station that's powering the um, crystal radio. It's the ground and it's electrons. Electrons are coming from this transmitter and coming over to this coil over here and powering it. Like a hundred electrons or a hundred million electrons or whatever number you want to come up with coming from here and then there's no more electrons involved in the process in the receiver coil. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And you can go back to the piano and put your foot on the pedal that lifts up the dampers so they're not resting on the keys. So all the strings are free. They're not being dampened. And so what happens is you hit that center C, just tap it, very little energy, and it vibrates. And not only does it vibrate, but the two strings beside that vibrate. Not only that, but it vibrates the soundboard and all the others. There's all, a whole bunch of strings in the piano vibrate. And you've got this mass extra energy that's an influence. And you can really think about that and ponder that. Now you fill a room full of pianos. And you do the same, you put like a, a brick on the pedal or whatever, so no one's wasting en energy in doing this by holding their foot down on a pedal. And you have a nice acoustic room, and suddenly all the pianos are vibrating after you just hit that one key. Or as I showed, strumming a guitar in a room full of guitars. 
and then they all start vibrating. So really, I have a gain of energy there. If you don't believe that, then I can't help you. <laughs> um, it's like saying that my snapping my fingers is equal in energy amount to the whole avalanche, right? If you believe that, then you can go back to watching your mainstream media <laughs> in your YouTube, silly YouTube videos. Watch some cat videos, maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, so let's go on. Okay, so Ricky, say, Rick, we know all these things so far. We'll tell us the rest. And that's really the purpose, but I had to kind of set the stage, if you understand. So now, what we're going to do, what do we do with this? This noise. What do we do with this mess of an avalanche going down the mountain? I mean, can we collect something? Or is it just a destructive force that we have to avoid and despise? And work against happening? Or can we use it? You know? I mean, I don't think it would be a practical thing to create energy collectors <laughs> for an avalanche because they don't happen enough to make it worthwhile to do something with it. But it's just an analogy. So now, what do we do with this? We have to have the right collector, right? In this case, I told you there's the right way and a wrong way to build this. And you can maximize it. You can have multiple sails on your sailboat. You could have multiple collect solar panels to collect the sun. Um, wind generators. In the case of a wind generator and a solar panel, though, you're not really able to duplicate the energy so much. Now, you could collect the energy from the EMFs produced in the solar panel. I'm not getting into that for several reasons. But anyway, nevertheless, you can measure the EMFs underneath your solar panels and consider that. But in this case, and in this case, the energy keeps on giving. And you can have multiple collectors and reuse the waves. Catch the wave, but you're not really catching it. You're influenced by the wave, and the influence keeps going on. So that's really critical to understand. Now, you don't have to believe that or understand that to also succeed in this, because what I'm going to talk about is multiple ways to get um, more out of a system. And so... What I'm going to talk about is the three major ones is the higher the voltage that you have, the more output you're going to get. The higher the frequency, if you know how to use higher frequency and collect it, the more you're going to get. And the sharper the impulse. Now an impulse is like, think about turning on a light switch. Okay, so if you were turning it on slowly, if you could really turn it on slowly, and you could do that with maybe kind of a slow resistance, or what's called a triangle wave or even a sine wave, rather than a square wave. So a square wave means you have a line, horizontal line, and then you're turning on, so that's power off, right? the off time. So over time you have the switch turned off and then suddenly you turn it on. If you turn it on slowly then you don't really, you have more of a triangle wave or whatever. And you turn it off slowly. But what we want, the sharper that we turn that on, the square of the wave, the better the gain. Again, people don't believe that either. That's fine. This kit kind of shows you that the difference between using the frequency generator and the um, very fast switching gate driver that we include in this. So it's a very sharp turning on and off. And 
it's kind of like when you think of turning off water pipes and that momentum um, is still flowing. Well, it's not really a proper analogy because electricity operates different than the water. Uh, so that's not the best analogy to use. Uh, but the sharper the pulse on and off, the greater the gain you're going to get. Now, when you're going to high frequency, you're already getting necessarily turning it on fast and turning it off fast. So it's not so important to look at that. I mean, I mean, for if you're doing a square wave, you're going to necessarily be a sharp square wave. But if you still have a triangle wave or a sine wave, then that's the difference. So if you do this kit and you turn your frequency generator to a sine wave, you'll see the results are completely different. So we're talking about unidirectional wave impulses, as we called it so many years ago. So one direction, but it's an impulse. It's not DC. DC is considered a constant current. We're just focused on the turning on of the switch or the turning off the switch. So those are three different things where you get gain. Now I'm going to talk about some more than that. So let's go over this. So now there's various things to understand here where you can fail. So when you have, let's go with the Don Smith analogy. When I create this process in here, it's a resonance process. So it's creating order out of disorder. So Don's analogy was, when you think about the electrons in a room, like random ping pong balls bouncing around all randomly. So there's no collective gain. It's all randomly bouncing around. But resonance creates order to all of them, just like marching um, army. When you go to the bridge, um, what's the term that they use? You have to step out of sync with each other. Otherwise you could bring down the bridge. And we've talked about that in other videos. So when you have a resonance process, it's like a magnet. It's drawing in more electrons in the air and through the ground. And so they're kind of focused on the kind of high voltage area of the circuit or the pieces of metal, whatever. And so they're just kind of hovering around. And so you have a higher concentration. It's like the air is electrified. The environment is electrified. And you can feel this. I think everybody, I mean, depending on what you're doing, like even with these coils, you can feel it. And I'm not saying that that's healthy to do, to be in that atmosphere for any period of time. So this is not something that you want to be exposed to any constant frequency for any length of time. So if you're going to create a system, you want to totally, I would say put a double Faraday cage, two layers um, around it so that nothing you're not, and then you're grounding those. So anyway, what you're going to do, what's, what's going to happen here is electrons are coming and going and it, you've got the, the on phase and the off phase. So electrons get drawn in, they get kind of wound up like a figure eight. So it's going to be, you know, you got to think three dimensionally. So it's like getting wound up and then unwind. So they're going to have their phase where they're, which we can call the um, positive um, or positive resistance. And that's like you have with your normal electrical processes where you're pushing the current 
in this case you're kind of sucking it in and you're winding this up like a toy like a yo-yo and then unwinding it like you turn it off then it unwinds back what we're going to do is collect that energy on the unwind phase or stage yeah phase in that case we don't want to actually collect the energy we don't want to interrupt the wind up stage just like we don't want to touch this glass on this plasma column or we don't want to have the coils touching on these two coils here so we want it to freely act and we want to get, we want the effects we want the avalanche so now um, the best way to do that is the ground the, the earth ground so I'm connected here you notice I'm not even touching the top plate this wire right here is simply disconnected so it's a full wave bridge and instead of connecting it to the top plate in this case it, because of what I'm doing it, it's more advantage just to connect it directly to ground so in other words I'm pulling in energy from the earth ground in this process and this plate this capacitor plate is a, a receiver of sorts but more of a be, being an influenced sail electrical sail and so what's happening is um, it's triggering electrons to be brought through that wire up and you can see when I disconnect it it will spark um, if I have it properly connected and if there is a ground in that but anyway if there is no connection to the ground you're still getting a connection to what's called an air ground so that is less electrons and so what's happening is um, I want to try and explain things in a way that people understand this now so now there's another concept that I want to talk about step charging I go over this in a lot more detail in my meetings but I wanted to start talking about the things they talk about in my meetings because I don't think I'll have I don't think there'll be opportunity to have any more so what's going on is um, when you are charging up a capacitor so let's look at a capacitor so here we have three different capacitors different types of capacitors we've got these plates here their capacitor we've got this um, yellow capacitor there which is I'm not even sure what that is exactly poly um, um, I can't remember which one it is now you've got an oil fill capacitor like you find this is like what you'd find in a microwave oven this one's 2000 volts 0.8 microfarad so this one can handle high frequency whereas these well this one down here isn't really rated for high frequency well it, it probably could handle it but ideally you want to go with kind of an oil or other types of high frequency capacitors that are more expensive so now what we're going to do here we're going to look at this usually I try and demonstrate that um, this all out and I'll go over it as much as we have time for at the end here but what we want to do is charge up that capacitor and discharge it now that capacitor is 250 volts maximum although I've never seen one blow up yet um, I haven't tried to do that 
but what's happening is every capacitor has its kind of sweet spot if you will you don't want to try and fully charge a capacitor because it takes a lot more like you tend to okay i want to state something here everybody thinks that this is the same to charge it no matter what you do you're going to have the same amount or i mean you might have a little bit more or less efficiency in people's minds depending on how fast how slow you charge it but essentially charging a capacitor is like a big loss in people's minds but that's not true at all no matter what you do in their minds but it's not true so if I step charge this capacitor and you can look that up there's very few articles on that but step charging a capacitor will re will make it more efficiency to more efficient according to how many steps you charge it so when you're charging a capacitor in this kind of system what we're going to do is step charge an oil fill capacitor this is what Don Smith's many of his systems were doing so this is where he calls a trumpet wave right so you start off with the initial so you have 28,000 times a second or 26,000 on this one so there's 26,000 impulses that create an influence on these plates and now it's going to go however you want to look at it down the wire or whatever and influence that capacitor to start charging now the first pulse is going to put that capacitor into a certain voltage now even without it turning on and you say you've discharged that that capacitor is going to bounce back to a certain voltage and then so this is all very it's gets very technical or not technical it you're going to have to learn this by experience but there is sweet spots to work in and this is where oversimplifying conventional energy uh, conventional knowledge is so ridiculously oversimplistic and then misses so many good truths by being so reductionistic so now so if we take the bounce back I mean we're not going to depend upon that very much but you've discharged the capacitor and you've disconnected the charge or the load and now you're going to find that it bounces back to a certain charge a certain voltage level but that's not what I'm really talking about here I just wanted to mention that first so now you've got this first impulse when I turn that on there's going to be one impulse I'm going to have a certain voltage level it's like cranking up think about a jack to my suburban I'm going to crank up you know with each you can look at it like leverage right I'm just kind of cranking it and I'm raising the car a little bit higher so I'm charging that capacitor and think of a capacitor like a battery although it's quite different in other respects so now I'm going to be with each impulse here I'm going to be step charging this capacitor higher and higher now if I try and go all the way to the top then it becomes it doesn't charge as easy as they get higher and that's obviously because well I don't need to get into all the details but um, it becomes less efficient after a certain point but there's that middle area of the capacitor where you can really work it right and so if I want to now transform the energy I'm going to tell you exactly how right now it's all in the Don Smith book so I'm charging up this oil filled capacitor say and say I want it to be um, 220 volts 
or say 240 volts. And so I'm step charging it 26,000 times a second. And I've so arranged all my parts so that I'll reach 240 volts at a given capacity, you know, microfarads. And now I'm going to discharge that 60 times a second. Right, so divide 60 into say 24,000 times and then you'll have how many impulses you get in the trumpet wave. So you're building up a charge in the capacitor with each impulse. But what I found, what, what I showed in this is I can discharge, I can charge up this capacitor and then it just basically comes to kind of a saturation point where in one second and then I try and discharge it as fast as I can but you know what no matter how fast or slow I do it it's always the same which means this is already saturated and charged up a lot faster than my hand can move. Maybe I can do it three times a second or four times. And you'll see it arcing here. I'll just kind of discharge it against itself. Short out the bridge. And here it is. I'll hold it up here. Here's another one of these. So what I have is these are actually diodes. The shot key diodes. And then I just have them connected together in a four-way bridge across in the capacitor. And the red wire, of course, is the positive. And this is just to short it out. Click, 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 click. And I'll bring this up and I'll show you a close-up later on. So now what's happening is if you just think about discharging that we're trying to run the load off of it as a constant current you're not going to get anything out of it and that's where people go wrong and they think there's nothing here oh well yeah I didn't get that much so now what Don showed in the Japan model you can see in the book where they're he's charging a step charging a capacitor and if you look really careful, you might see something in that picture. I, so far, no one's ever noticed it but me. And I've told a number of you already, so... <laughs> but look carefully at the pictures. Anyway, your step charging capacitor... And I haven't talked about the ground connection yet. This is very important, because I want to go over each stage here. Give you the whole system and a variety of systems that you can use because you're going to need them in the next couple of months because the power is going out people the infrastructure is compromised already and you're going to have power blackouts and you're going to want to get away from this present world that means the the system of the world and live far enough away from all this craziness over the next couple of decades because it's about to get real. Anyway, that's another story as I've already covered. Remember, I was the first one really to talk about the Great Reset. And uh, it took five months for everybody to start talking about it. So go back and watch my video on that and ask yourself, why did it take so long? Another story anyway. So, so we're going to be step charging this oil fill capacitor and now we're going to have, say, an SCR. Now, an SCR, which I've got them lying around all over the place here. Um, an SCR is like a diode that has a, a means of turning it on. Not really a means of turning it off. But you have an SCR, or you could have a MOSFET or transistor in line with the positive terminal because these are polarized 
You want a polarized capacitor. And now you're going to be, I mean, you could, you could do the same thing on the negative side too, but let's just say that you're going to run, you're going to discharge that capacitor 60 times a second, a little 555 timer circuit. I should probably start making a little kit for that too. And then you just have that discharging into a transformer. And I didn't grab a transformer that you could see. I've got many, many transformers, but you know, the classic transformer, I mean, here's an air transformer, but we're not really thinking that way. But what you're going to do, if you think of this side as the primary and this side as the secondary, so you're going to run the positive connection, or you could have this is more. So this is 250 or 2,500 volts, 30 microfarad. So this is a pretty serious system right here that you would be using. So say you're step charging this oil fill capacitor through a system like this, and now. And I'm not talking about the grounding yet, but we'll get there. You're going to be connecting through diodes. You're going to be coming to an SCR and discharging that SCR 60 times a second for your 60 or 50 if you're uh, 50 hertz in the rest of the world. And then it's going to go through this transformer primary, which is also in resonance at that frequency. Now we're talking about 60 hertz frequency, so we're going to have a capacitor, a resonance capacitor across the primary of the transformer. Right? So we have various stages of resonance. We have the primary coil or process here that's in resonance. We have the collector coil. If we want to look at, in this case, this kit, this would be its own kit. So this is the primary, this red wires here, that's in resonance. It's got its own resonance capacitor. And then, and of course, we're not talking about tuning these two together at this point, but quarter wavelength and all that, which is also another game. But these coils or coil are also in resonance. And they can be not even tuned to each other and still have an amazing effect. So don't get too hung up about those details. So now What's going to happen is this is going to function if this was, you know, a coil meant for 60 hertz or 50 hertz cycles per second or whatever. Um, now you're discharging that properly with the SCR or the semiconductor. Now, the way to do this more properly is not use air grounds, but have a connection. So for example, if you're not using a full wave bridge, which means four diodes creating a conversion isolation, um, where you have a negative and a positive, you could actually have two diodes coming off of either side of this capacitor going to the SCR and you can have the negative be connected to ground. Oh, I forgot to bring the resistor. Um, so I have a big resistor that's a low value resistor. So now think about this. In the resonance process, I'm 
drawing in electrons from the ground ideally. I don't want them coming from my body. I don't want to really bring them from the air, but I want to collect them from the ground. So you're drawing in, that's why you see with this kit, at least double the energy coming in when you connect it to ground. More or less, depending on s several factors. Um, anyway, so what's going to happen now is you're going to connect a ground, a good, nice thick ground cable, depending on how much you're going to run. If you're going to want kilowatts, and don't get stuck in between this. So now you're going to be pulling in during the on phase. You're going to be sucking in electrons right into the system and they're going to whiz past that resistor like it's not there right you think that's counterproductive because that resistor why would you want to put a resistor there rick what's the point well what you do is you have a resistor that becomes like a diode a one-way valve so you've wound up these electrons to the highest point where they're congregated if you will at the busy end of the circuit and now they want to go in the rest phase they want to unwind back down to ground and they're going to take the path of least resistance so what's the resistance of your coil of your primary um, transformer of the transformer and you want that to be a lower resistance than the resistor coming on the ground side of the input and then on the other side of the primary you can run that back to ground and this creates this electron cycling and that's kind of unique to Don Smith teaching that very clearly, which again, until I did that video where I quoted him specifically on the subject and created this index book, I didn't see anybody ever talk about that. Now, maybe somebody did. I don't know why we don't see anybody discussing that. And mysteriously, after I put that up there, nobody's really talking about it yet. It's quite mysterious. <laughs> when you say something very important and people don't address it. Um, it's kind of like, well, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about the election, but that's too controversial. Anyway, another subject. So, so you're cycling electrons. See now where everybody failed that I saw online is they just had a, connection to ground period and guess what the electrons come into the system and they don't work for you as they could sure they're doing some work you know, they're spinning and they're giving off flux and so forth but you don't want to force them you want them to work on the negative resistance phase when they're on they're back unwinding that's where you want to power your loads on. That's what Don said specifically. He's right. So why force everything when it can work for you for free? That's the point. Hmm. It sounds like that's what's happening in society today. You know, whatever, another subject. So, so what happens is when people connect directly to a ground, they're not really benefiting as much as they could be because the electrons are going to go right back down the path they came and not go down through your load. But if you have some resistance there, then it creates, it wants to go to the path of least resistance. So let it go down that path and do some work for you. And if you load down the secondary, it also creates a path of less resistance as well. And again, the key is everything, every single thing in resonance. That means your primary 
coil is also your primary transformer is in resonance. Now I show this at my meeting where I have a um, neon sign transformer and I run it without any capacitor because the non comes with it. Nobody ever tells you to put a capacitor across it. And I put, in this case, it was for the 60 hertz, it was 60 microfarads. And that will tell you the inductance of my primary on that particular model that I was showing. I think that was the 5,000 volt one. Anyway, 60 millihertz, or um, not hertz, uh, milliamps, 60 milliamps. Anyway, you measure with LCR meter, you put it into the calculation to find out what is the cap value, the capacitor value that you need to have for optimum resonance. So when I added that capacitor, I was drawing three to four times less energy to do the same load. Produce maximum, like we looked at an arc, and it drew the same amount of energy, or sorry, it drew a third to a quarter of the energy that it took being out of resonance. So that's very important because at resonance, at, well, at radio frequency at least, you have superconductivity. Now that wasn't at radio frequency, but it's still a path of least resistance, it's less resistance in resonance. So that might help you a little bit with the question of the, this video. Oops. So now what's happening is everything has to be in resonance and not fighting each other. You have to, this is where it becomes an art, knowing the difference between doing adverse actions, activities that cancel things out. Like I said, I just gave you a point where if you cycle electrons appropriately, they'll take the path of least resistance that will work for you. But if you just have merely the connector to the ground and you don't have any resistance in between. Now you see in Do John Don's diagrams all these symbols at those points and then he flat out tells you. Now until I showed the video one and two you didn't have that context where he specifically says that to you. That's why I highlighted in that, that smaller video where I just quoted him in that respect. And some of you said, ah, oh, ha. And then we never heard from you again because that solved all your answer, that solved all your questions that you had. And then you actually went to do these things. So, so I'm going through the phases here, the stages, phases, whatever. And I'm trying to make that clear. So, like I said, the main one that I wanted to focus on here is the idea of step charging the capacitor and discharging it. People are like, well, how do I change the frequency from high frequency to low frequency? Well, you step charge a capacitor and you discharge that capacitor at a lower frequency. As simple as that. Now you can go into kind of low pass filters and stuff like that where you and you pretty much have to put some resistance in the line to <coughs> to as well to avoid like this is where it gets a little bit more technical um, where you get kind of noise in the line from the higher frequency it can have effect on things so you know, that's another matter. So if you go really big with this whole system, you have to deal with all these safety features and, and stuff like that. And you have to have proximities, you know, spacing and so forth. Um, but anyway, this is also a means of, of um, smoothing things out, if you will. 
you know, driving it through an air core like that. And this is the exact same one that Don used. And of course this is, it might recognize too, it's the exact same system right here that Don used. These are just my models that I show at my meetings. Anyway, um, so another means of gain, the fourth means of gain is the connection to the ground where we're, we're, we're allowing, and not just arbitrary connection to the ground, uh, electron cycling means. There's really two points to that, where you're creating a path of least resistance that works for you. Again, so this is where the theory matters. If you don't have the theory right, you don't care, you don't even try those things because you don't believe in them. Um, so if you don't want to believe, then pay for your electric. Be my guest. So then, um, what else do I want to cover here? So then, what is the key? Why does Don Smith's system result in CPS squared or even cubed? <laughs> and that's CPS cycles per second. So here's from his page in his book. Here's a page from his book. And I want to read this. Now, unfortunately, it wasn't written for beginners. And it's kind of choppy. So you got to kind of meditate upon his sentences because he didn't always write them very well. I mean, here's a guy who was writing these things when he had strokes and all that. So it wasn't... The, the I's weren't dotted and the T's weren't crossed, per se, all the time. So let's go over this. And I want you to understand the value of frequency here and voltage. So he says, useful electrical power is generated when electrons from earth and air groundings are disturbed by the movement of coils and magnets with reference to each other. The resulting electrical and magnetic energy is then changed to joules, watts seconds, volts times amps times seconds. Each forward electron movement results in a magnetic impulse and each return movement causes an electrical impulse. The composite of the electrical energy impulses from these electrons yields useful energy, power. All right, so let the above electron movement be represented by a room full of ping pong balls bouncing randomly. Most of the energy present cancels out by random impacts. This is classic under unity approach to electrical power generation sanctioned by the establishment. So in contrast to that, the electrical energy generation system presented here, the resonant electrons are all moving in the same direction at the same time. This allows near unity electrical power to develop. This is the room temperature equivalent of superconductivity. The energy system presented here consists of properly adjusted and functioning resonant air coil and tank or air core coil tank and a tank is a, a capacitor and inductor that are in resonance with a matching frequency so the right capacitance the right inductance that will put them in resonance with the ideal frequency so in this case in our, our case with our coils here, we have uh, whatever the inductance of this is, and then we have the matching 100 picofarad capacitor, oops, there, and then the frequency fundamental is, um, is 1,250,000 times cycles per second or 1.25 mega, 1 megahertz. 
and that will make this a tank circuit. Well, at least when it's in parallel, they usually call that more of a tank circuit. Anyway, the magnetic energy is stored in the coil system, right? Just like you have in your motor, right? Magnetic energy pushing a magnet or a generator influencing the coils magnetically. And the electrical energy is stored in the capacitors. From Maxwell and others we know that electrical related energy has an equal amount of magnetic energy associated with it. The formula L will, which establishes useful energy of system equals joules equal 0 0.5 times C times V squared times CPS squared. Joules, volts, amps times seconds, watt seconds. Capacitance, C is equal to capacitance in microfarads. V is potential in volts. CPS, cycles per second. So the transfer of electrical power by resonant induction is a direct function of the squaring of the cycles per second. For example, square 60 cycles per second and then square the radio frequency cycles per second of the system presented here. Obviously, 1 million cycles per second transfers more energy than 60 cycles per second. The sanctioned method of electrical power generation uses 60 cycles per second method. Using 60 cycles per second and the random scattering of electrical electrons system assures the establishment of its desired under unity goal where you're going to have to pay for the energy. This random bouncing of electrons is the ohms of ohms law and it is used to establish the rate of dissipation and or load work. So when you're not in resonance then you're not getting what you could and when you're in this low frequency of 60 Hertz you're also not going to have that superconductivity benefit. So you're going to have losses and more losses and you're going to have to push it the whole way. So think about oh, the other example that I often give of the avalanche effect. So if I have a little pin and I'm a little tiny person and there's this massive giant who's a hundred times my size and I prick his foot then his whole body is going to move. Very little energy input but it causes him to move quite a bit. So that's the way you want to think about it. But you have to be at the right time to do that otherwise you get squashed. <laughs> anyway, in the resonant tank induction energy transfer system presented here, which again everything is in resonance, um, impedance, which is the system resistance, replaces conventional ohms usage. So normally you have the resistance of this wire is calculated by its length and width so forth. But when you're dealing with a resonant high frequency system there is no resistance. So this is where people get muddled up because at the lower frequencies and out of re resonance you have resistance and you're fighting your way in electrical circuits. But once you get into resonance, a proper system and high frequency, you don't have, it becomes zero. So, and the full force and effect of the energy transfer occurs. This is superconducting conditions at room temperature. At radio frequency, the electrons do not pass through the conductor as they do at lower frequencies. Instead, these electrons encircle the conductor and are free of the conductor's resistance. So these are very important principles. If you don't grasp these things, that's why I created this kit. Well, kind of improved upon a kit um, with a whole bunch of different points and um, 
experiments that you can learn these points at a safe lower level. So the establishment's power generation be called A and the, uh, the present system presented here be called B. So with A, given 60 cycles per second at 120 volts using a 10 microfarad capacitor, which happens to be, this happens to be a 10 microfarad capacitor right here. Um, so now charging up this capacitor 60 times per second at 120, vo 120 volts. It's very little energy. So, again, when we calculate joules times that, um, the establishment's method only permits less than 10 watt seconds of useful electrical energy. But using the vendor's resonant induction system, Don Smith's, the electrical power available would be uh, 259.2 joules watts per second. So that's quite a bit more. So even if we don't um, have high frequency, we still have a much bigger gain using um, a resonant system. Now, if we're doing, if we're changing the cycles per second to one million cycles per second, which is what we're doing here, even more than one million, what can we do if we were charging up, now in this case that would be a bigger system than what we normally input into this, but so if we're charging up a t 10 microfarad capacitor with 100,000 volts, we can create, let me see how many zeros this is. We're squaring the cycles per second and then we're going through the whole thing. And in the end, we've got 50 megawatts <laughs> of power. So that sounds outrageous. People are probably gonna laugh at that. Um, but when you fully implement this whole thing, you can understand that. So, that's where we really haven't talked too much about voltage amplification, but if you have higher voltage, higher frequency, higher impulse or sharper impulse with the grounding, you have way more power than you could possibly ever use. And it becomes extremely dangerous actually. That's why I'm very hesitant in like fully demonstrating those things uh, because I know that people are going to kill themselves by doing that. So that's why I tried to save a whole bunch of lives by doing this. And I think people have been satisfied with these kits. So now we'll probably end up doing um, a secondary coil, maybe inside, or if we use, I'm, trying to, I'm tending more to use the ones without the bases now, so we might have another coil going around this and maybe I could put the terminals on the inside here something like that anyway if we use the secondary here just like in this case in this case it's on around the outside but bring this in the picture here so then we can still use all the secondary coils, receiver coils, relay coils, whatever you want to call them, external to this whole system. Because again, you're not sucking up the flux. It still goes out, right? It still broadcasts out and influences other coils. And that was Don's first system that he, when he went beyond this kit, he ended up realizing that he could put multiple coils around and collect more and more energy and repeat the whole thing. Um, but what I want to do is have, when you have a really closely coupled secondary, 
then all the flux passes through it. And then um, we can focus on that rather than a further like Don said in the book, this is kind of represent the Bearden um, method, whereas this is the more proper method to do. So this was just a simple tool to show you the various geometry relationships and the gain that you can get. And, you know, you can have many collectors just like adding these plates here. So we'll see what we we'll do there, but right now I'm going to do some demonstration. So what I want to, I think there's some things I could show here, a couple things. So this is one of you, one of you guys recommended doing this. This is a bridge system that's kind of a step down where you have a whole bunch of lower voltage capacitors that are in a arrangement here where you're stepping down or you're you're taking high voltage and you are uh, transforming it to higher capacitance so if you don't want to use a transformer to step down voltages you can do something like this Anyway, that's not my point to bring up. The other point is how fast your capacitors are. So here is a Dura cap, and I talked to the president of this company, and these are the fastest caps that he had. They're like photo flash. They're they're faster than photo flash. They're um, strobe these are strobe for strobe caps so but ultimately you want to get some um, like <coughs> electrolytic are only going to go so far um, they're not going to be fast enough of course your ultra caps are faster but they are lower voltage so they're not going to be very i mean very useful because they're quite low in voltage. Um, so I guess the main points that I wanted to make here, and I'll demonstrate this now, the main point is that people don't recognize the difference between trying to run this maybe into some kind of DC load instantly rather than doing the whole process of properly step charging suitable capacitor and then discharging it like you can run this into a DC or a um, electrolytic capacitor but you've got some um, things to deal with to smooth it out you have to create the right filter with resistors and so forth and then um, you know stepping down voltage and all that but if you're going to run an AC system these things can work now the other thing that I want to mention before I forget is you have several different symbols on the Don Smith circuits and people want to oversimplify and think that it's just one process but there's actually two processes there's that concept that I talked about of creating a resistor kind of a diode effect that's why you see it can sometimes symbolized like a diode or and that is to create the effect that I talked about in the cycling but the other is that you have an MOV or varistor <coughs> concept so so on the high voltage side of the capacitor for example you'll have a suitable um, device to ground that will cut off the spike so that you don't have the straight well um, you have more stability 
But that's a whole science in itself because what you'll find is you can damage those if you don't get the right match. So in other words, if it's having to work too hard, it will wear out. And secondly, um, they do come on, they start working at a certain voltage. So, um, and then they get to the maximum point where they'll cut it off. So you have to realize that in voltage suppression, it's, it's involved to learn that. Um, but yeah, I just told you the kind of bare bones system here that you can run with. And each resonance stage, you can have its grounding, your grounding cycling too. And they can all be hooked up to the same ground connector at the end result, right? You don't have to have multiple grounds. So let's turn this thing on and see what we can come up with here. Let's show what's going on here. Let's remove some of these things. So what we're going to do, and we've got this power supply here. Now what we're going to do is look at the oscilloscope, which should be still working the way I left it. So I'm going to turn on So you can see, if I touch this, you can see it's going to follow me around, right? So maybe I'll turn off some lights here so you can see it better. So you can see the oscilloscope. All right, sorry, not the oscilloscope. This oscilloscope's right here. We'll look at that in a minute. But you can see, this is what we don't want to happen. Like, this is what people did. You know, now I don't have a dipole. We've got the energy kind of going this way instead of up and down. See, here we have oscillation up and down. I mean, it's kind of a little bit more random than that, but we want to create this wind sail here, yeah, effect. So I will show you the frequency in a minute, but right now what I'm going to do, right now I have this shorted out, the capacitor is completely shorted out. So I'm going to pulse it. So you can see on the oscilloscope, So if I take a long time to charge this capacitor, it's it's a waste of energy. Oops. Hopefully I didn't damage this. Okay now. So there is a point where I can charge this. So this will build so this is not the most efficient way. So what you want is a lower, instead you want a lower capacitor value and you want to discharge it more frequently. So you can see here, I don't have the time shown on there, but anyway I want to show you the voltage. Two point 2.7 kilovolts. But you see, I'm affecting this. So what we'll do, um, so yeah, I mean that's a really high voltage <laughs> that we're showing here. So we need to actually bring it down. Those are 500 volts.
500 volt. Um, oh wait, I'm connected to the negative there. So we'll go to the positive. I'm not going to connect the negative. It might damage. I've already ruined so many of these probes here, so. So those are 100 volt intervals. So my point is, let me bring the camera over and show this. So the idea here, so you can see 250 volts, 10, 10 microfarad cap here. So we can look at this, it's connected to this plate, and you can see this, you know, so you want this to be like, so you can see the spacing there. And this isn't quite lined up properly here with this edge here and this edge here. Um, anyway, the circuit, okay, well, first of all, I've got this connected to ground right here. Right. And so what we're doing here, because I can only do this probably three or four times a second. So I've got to make proper contact. There's a lot of arcing there. So if I can do this fast enough, I have to slow down the time there because you can't really see it. So the point is, if I pulse this 60 times a second, I'm going to get a whole lot more. If I change the cap to a different size, and I go up higher in voltage, I'm going to get a gain there as well. So it's all a trade-off, what you do. So if you're going to work with, you know, 2,000 volts and low microfarads or picofarads, well, probably nanofarads, um, you're going to get a whole lot more out of it. So with a system like this, you can produce kilowatts. <laughs> you might laugh at me. I mean, if you're multiplying some more plates and um, you're using the proper grounding and you're doing everything that I talked about today, you can actually produce a lot of energy. And I guess that's as much as I want to say about all this. Um, I usually cover more in my meetings, but... I just wanted to cover this in a basic, um, basic way here. So I think that gives you a lot to work with, and you can use that resonance kit here. Um, you know these these kits. You know to um, play around with these concepts. So thanks for watching.